So it's now my pleasure to introduce our second plenary speaker in this session, it's Professor Lord Julian Hunt. He's the Emeritus Professor of Climate Modeling and Honorary Professor of Mathematics at University College London. Professor Hunt earned a first-class honors degree in mechanical sciences at Trinity College, Cambridge in 1963, and he was awarded a PhD from the same university for his work on aspects of magnetohydrodynamics in 1967. He began his faculty career in Cambridge as a lecturer in applied mechanics and engineering, and then as a reader in fluid mechanics, and uh, finally as professor for the years 1990 to 1992. In 1992 and until 1997, he served as Director General and Chief Executive of the UK Meteorological Office. He was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in the UK in 1989. In 2000, he was created a Baron in the House of Lords uh, with the title Lord Hunt of Chesterton. Professor Hunt's studies of turbulent and stratified flows and dispersion modeling have been applied to many problems in environmental fluid mechanics, including building design, the siting of wind energy generators, and assessment of the transport and dispersion of air pollution. His lecture this evening is on the topic urban climate, environmental fluid mechanics, and policy issues. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Professor Lord Julian Hunt. Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's a great honor to be invited to uh, this uh, very interesting uh, conference on indoor air. But uh, as the previous speaker has saying, indoor air is strongly connected to outdoor air. Uh, and so I shall try to draw, draw the connections. Um, I suppose I might give another aspect to my, to my CV. Uh, in the uh, winter of 1952, I'm so old, uh, that I was in London for the London smog. My, my father worked in the British civil service where we had a little nice open fire every day where a, a lady, I'm afraid, came in and cleared the fire and put wood and paper and coal. And that's how all of London was uh, heated. Uh, and of course, it was extremely polluting. There was this famous uh, uh, event when uh, for several days, about four or 5,000 people died. But the British got really, really upset when the cows started dying at the Smithfield uh, um, agricultural show. As you know, in Britain, animals are generally more important than people. So if the animals were taking it seriously, it's obviously something had to be done. However, I also want to sort of um, uh, talk a, a, a bit about, you know, how the urban environment is developing and perhaps um, a little bit earlier than that, uh, Wordsworth uh, was standing on Westminster Bridge in 1802, looking at London and described, the earth has not anything to show more fair. I never felt a calm so deep. So that was rather uh, uh, a marvelous poetic view of London. And I'll show you a slide in a moment. Um, but then I thought coming up to date, I've, uh, one of the uh, questions is whether urban, urban areas should become more like green garden cities. Um, well, they have a rather skeptical view about this in Nigeria, uh, and it's a rather nice poem. This is Port Harcourt, the garden city. I envisage a great change with great velocity. He feeling that something needs to be done about it. Of course, the other thing about cities, they don't all survive. Uh, one of the greatest uh, cities uh, was Xanadu in north, uh, northern China, which actually has a UNESCO World uh, Heritage Site, but it doesn't exist except under the ground. Right, now let's move on. Now, what do I do? I can move on now. No, this way. By the way. No, do I click, move this way? What do I do? Click. click. Well, um, we've actually um, been discussing again uh, um, some of the introductory speak, uh, plenary speakers. Uh, and indeed, uh, um, Jan uh, was talking a bit about what is the subject of indoor environment. 
Well, there's a very nice essay written by Charles Dickens, who don't, one doesn't normally think of as a historian of science, but I've re recently reading his work and find that he actually had some of the wisest remarks about the development of a new science. He wrote an extraordinary essay called Founding a New Ology, because in the middle of the 19th century, you had the beginnings of geology, meteorology, um, pharmacology, psychology, these are all ologies. I notice that indoor air is not an indoor air ology. I suggest that to the organizers uh, uh, to follow in that tradition. But the inter interesting point was that, um, as I shall come to in a moment, uh, uh, he was um, thinking about if we were to, as it would be like Charles Dickens and, uh, and review the ology questions uh, in the 1860s, at the same time as, I, as Abe Lincoln was talking, as we heard today, you had the problems of industrial and shipping pollution, disease, heating of urban areas, and the uh, buildings, of course, were simple building spaces. Transport produced uh, uh, not much pollution then, but progressively, of course, the horse turned into engines. But interestingly, if you're reading at that time, they had ex also great concerns about long-term environmental issues. The first one, of course, was evolution, where we came from and what we were like and what was the explanation of uh, 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 of the, for example, the burning and the combustion. And of course, there was an even more worrying, much more worrying than climate change. There was the theory uh, in the 1860s that the sun was going to get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer because they didn't know about nuclear physics and they just thought eventually. So in Charles Dickens's uh, rather ominous descriptions of this gloomy, dark, uh, polluted city, he thought it's even worse because the sun is going to be losing its power. Fortunately, he, Kelvin was wrong on that. Um, at the same time, of course, there were some other interesting developments. Uh, the idea of which is we, we will talk about uh, of a vortex uh, uh, producing an impulse. That's when you breathe out. That's exactly the sort of thing that Professor Hugo Lee and his team talk about. Um, um, and of course, uh, one of the other interesting developments was which way does the noise go in a city? Does it go with the wind, against the wind? That was only just being discovered then. Um, Oh, I, don't, I, do, I do seem to be, this is, uh, I go this way now? Right, so here is London, um, uh, the, the, the fair city of Wordsworth, and what do you see in the front? You see all the London's garbage being carried downstream, and you see the Tower of London. Uh, you see, of course, that uh, in our city we have uh, pollution in the streets. The typical uh, numbers of people dying from air pollution in the in the streets of Britain is of the order of 30, 40,000 a year, excess deaths. Um, in London it, it, alone, it may be several thousand per year. Um, oh, God. Right, so if you come to 2010, 2010s, where we are now, of course, the pollution pattern is somewhat different. We have local transport um, and the distant effects from shipping um, in some cities of the world, that's a very serious matter. We have disease from rising temperatures, from some of the factors we've heard. We have uh, pollution associated with heating and cooling now in ventilation in buildings. So I want, thought I might mention um, that I um, am in the House of Lords. Uh, it's a curious thing in Britain, but you can be in the second chamber as a sort of part-time job. I think it has some merits because you then, when you're not there, you're learning about other things. And one of the most important uh, kind of omissions in our recent legislation on energy for buildings was to neglect the importance of ventilation. I, I made several speeches about this point uh, and I think it's still a, 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 an important question. But the long-term environmental issues that affect uh, outdoor and indoor pollution, the effects of the environment of cities, uh, are the following. Biodiversity is being affected, urbanization moving over the countryside, and the human-induced climate change is changing the temperature. It's also then affecting the, 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 the environment, it's affecting the resources that we have, and of course it produces extreme hazards. The new science which we need in our ology is the urban-indoor inter interaction we need to know uh, from the areas that I know about fluid mechanics, we need to know more about the chaotic diffusion and mixing in, in buildings and the fact that it's not very uniform. And the new developments are that, of course, we have information technology that is enabling people to understand the trends, to make measurements, 
uh, and perhaps to produce feedback, and I'll come back to that. Now, in general, if you make progress in science, in an ology, you first of all, as Charles Dickens said, have data, exploration, analysis, and you make mistakes. The next stage um, is that uh, you have theories and qualitative concepts. And unless you have qualitative concepts, you don't really, you haven't really understood your subject. As Poincaré said with mathematics, unless you can turn mathematics into words, you haven't really understood it. He said that 50 years after Dickens had said it, by the way. And the final point, which I think is even more important if you're trying to concern, to relate um, science to policy, is you've got to explain the fundamentals in non-technical terms. You've got to express them in very general, general ways, hopefully that the uh, science in one area can be generalized to other disciplines. An example, for example, is the idea of feedback, which is an electrical engineering idea, is now a very broad concept that applies in many areas of science uh, and knowledge. Or chaos is another one, which meets this third criterion uh, of, of Dickens' idea of progress. Now, cities, of course, um, um, have uh, uh, environments that often are polluted, and these are, this is a rather gloomy set of pictures here. Um, and the, the, um, but of course, there's a happy picture of Hong Kong and an, an, an unhappy picture of Hong Kong that you can see. Um, sometimes it's clean and sometimes it's polluted. But the most remarkable thing that I've put at the, at the top of this slide is the fact that the sort of significant climate change we expect is on the, on the period of 50 years. These are the changes we're seeing in temperature uh, and extremes. And in old fashioned countries like the UK and most of Europe, uh, um, uh, and even most of America now, the, the rate of change of urban areas is on the same time scale. But in China, we're in a completely different world where cities are doubling in population, doubling and changing their activities in periods of 10 years. Some from 5 million to cities are going from 5 million to 10 million in, in very short periods. So in fact, the most rapid changes in those countries are because the cities are growing so fast. And that has very special features, which I want to discuss. Um, a city like uh, Singapore is an example. I was, there re I was there recently where not only, of course, they have pollution from their own shipping, which I don't think is controlled very well, um, uh, but also, of course, they have pollution that's coming from the burning of forests. And then, of course, they have a city in which many people are living in air conditioning, which leads to the problems that I heard about when I was there. So cities have different uh, pr properties, different problems, um, but the, and, uh, the, the real point to take away here is very different timescales. Now when we uh, consider as sort of, as, as sort of physicists uh, or modelers uh, the, the nature of the urban environment, uh, we have to think of it um, in terms of an overall urban scale, which I call LU where you have modified natural phenomena, the weather changes, climate, artificial pollutants, and of course is very much uh, controlled by the inversion layer, which might be, might, be, might be down to 500, 400 meters. There was a rather nice European, um, in Europe, you know, we always compromise. Um, I mean, everybody has to be the same. So there was a European study of what is the height of the inversion layer in large cities in Europe. Well, nobody could agree at all on this, which is the most fundamental question for air pollution. So they said it was 300 meters plus or minus 300 meters, which is a very good uh, uh, compromise. Um, so that's a sort of what we call Euro harmonization. The fact is that um, uh, that is an area of science, and China actually has these very tall towers, and the sort of uh, the, uh, the um, installations we were hearing in Hong Kong today will be important. The other feature, of course, is that uh, urban environments have very important external interactions. The regional weather is affected downstream of these large urban areas in China up to 500 kilometers uh, away, as, as research at Hong Kong City University has shown. But on the other hand, the, 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 the cities being in, in, in sandstorm areas produces an extraordinary effect from, from the outside to the inside. When we go down to smaller scales on the, si on the size of a few streets or buildings, we have the neighborhood scale. And one of the points I want to make is that uh, buildings are not simply a building and then the outside, there is this sort of zone. And if you go to Hong Kong and down, uh, downtown Hong Kong, you'll see this extraordinary zone between the building and the outside. You'll have 
uh, canopies uh, and people shop doing the, selling their goods inside and outside. Uh, and uh, you'll see this, in, of course, in, in classical cities where you have kind of, uh, uh, colonnades and so on. So this is a schematic of the same diagram. It's particularly important to see this. Can I what? Oh, God. It seems very difficult to go backwards. Perhaps this is progress. Um, I think if I press this button, that's right, then I get into trouble. So here is our, our inversion height in which most of the pollution takes place. And the inversion height can increase or decrease over a city depending upon the wind speed. It's greatly affected, of course, by mountains, as we see here. Sometimes, of course, our cities are affected by the coasts and hills. Now, the, I just want to make a couple of points about human-induced climate change, which, of course, there's been much in the newspapers. Um, this is a summary, in fact, by the British Met Office of the IPCC document. There's confidence that the world is warming because we can see changes across our climate system, including increasing temperatures, sea level rise, sink shrinking glaciers, and reducing Arctic sea ice. It's the cause of more than half the observed increase in global average temperature from 1951 to 2010, and a high confidence this has warmed the ocean, raised sea levels, and changed some climate extremes. And there's a very strong link between the total carbon dioxide emissions, which, uh, as uh, other speakers have commented, are very strongly in cities, and global warming. So if you want to think of a carbon budget to, um, which should plan, plan your policies for exceeding a given temperature, that's the way to do it. And in order to keep the global warming below 2 degrees, the society will need to keep the total emissions of carbon to below essentially double what we've already done historically, which is a very big challenge. Now, um, this is a graph just to uh, give you a bit of mathematics to, as well as the words. What is very interesting, if you look at the probability that the, um, the climate, whether in the city or outside the city, it is going to have a period in which the, the, in which the atmosphere is the same, either very hot, very cold, very wet, very dry, a so-called blocking period, you'll see that uh, the possibility of having a blocking period of eight days, 12 days, 16 days, obviously decreases. But this dashed line is a very worrying trend because what this says is that by the second half of the century, we'll be having an equal probability of hot periods or cold periods lasting up to 20 days, 24 days. So this dashed line is an indication of this um, tendency of blocked flows our whole civilization depends on the weather changing periodically. If the weather remains fixed for long periods, then, um, then we, oh God. Sorry, I'm on. Uh, then we are in trouble. Um, now, uh, in fact, this, there was some interesting confirmation from the US research published last week in Nature. If we now move on to the question of climate change here in Hong Kong, perhaps one of the interesting points here, the statistics, the daily maximum, for the daily maximum temperature bigger than 35 degrees Celsius, the return period in 19, the year 1900, and remember Hong Kong was making measurements way back in the 19th century. Um, it was 32 years, as it were, for a, an extreme to return. Now that's 4.5 years. That's an amazing, amazing change. Um, and what we had before was an hourly rainfall bigger than 100 millimeters per hour. That's a lot of rain. It wouldn't happen, uh, it wouldn't repeat for 37 years. Now it repeats every 18 years. Now these extreme events and trends vary greatly over climatic zones, e.g. flooding, pollution from deforestation. So it's very important to watch that. Um, I've mentioned regional uh, urban interactions. This is a picture to show cities affect the area outside it and vice versa. If you look at uh, uh, local urban areas, of course, we have buildings and streets in these groups. These affect the airflow around them. And nowadays, as I shall show you, we're beginning to be able to model and, in fact, make interesting predictions. And depending quite sensitively on how your city is, uh, is planned, and more importantly, how much you control cities. And I should give you a little, uh, you may be bored with too much. I, I, when I was an academic in Cambridge, um, I was also a city councillor. I was leader of the Labour Party on Cambridge City Council. It's the sort of thing you used to be able to do. And, um, 
And one of the things I did was to get people to take measurements in a sort of city area like this. This is a European city in Italy. And found that the air pollution was very high. So we had got my city councillors to say, let's block off all the traffic and let's get the students to do a survey to see what result was. Of course, the results were very positive uh, and there are no more traffic in the center of Cambridge. Um, so that's the kind of thing you guys should be out there if you're serious about uh, ch changing the environment. Well, this, here's a different sort of environment in, in, in India with a chap on a motorbike and a history. So it's not, a, a, and a, a hut. So we want to consider these um, very different sorts of environment, but the, the, the neighborhood scale uh, is absolutely crucial to uh, considering the health uh, of and, and temperature and so on. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier this question of the zone between outdoor and indoor. This is a rather busy slide due to Professor Nung, who will be, Edward Nung will be lecturing uh, later this week. So this is a, a typical area of Hong Kong where you see this kind of slow merge from inside the building to outside the buildings to underpasses. And this is a, a kind of cityscape that's happening around the world. So you can't think of a defined barrier between the building and the outside. You actually have a zone. Now these are most of all a classical building like this where you've definitely got an outside and inside. Um, and uh, I shall come to that in a moment. Now, one of the really uh, uh, interesting pieces of research in the last 10 years has been to understand um, the, the sig significant variations in the climate and, and the temperature and therefore the health um, in cities depending upon the green areas and the built up areas. So, uh, and this is during the day, uh, my colleagues in, in Phoenix, Arizona, for example, you'll see that uh, the typical temperature in the rural areas and the urban areas is comparable during the day. But at night time, um, you'll see then that the country, uh, the rural areas will, of course, cool quite quickly. Um, and uh, depending on the, on the precise nature of the buildings, you will it will continue to be warm in the city. And, depending on how long it remains warm, this has a very big effect on health. So, for example, in Paris, when they look, looked at the deaths in, in uh, 2003, that uh, showed that where there was retained heat over along many hours into the night, there was higher mortality in these extreme events. But there are other areas in cities that are green areas. So then the question comes, if you're a planner, if you're going to think of green areas, so here's an example, uh, you see this diagram here, that the temperature drops, uh, when you and the airflow moves over a green area in a city. The question is, should you have lots of small green areas or should you have a few enormous parks in the city? The answer is quite clear from the, the physics that it's better to have lots of small ones that actually reduces the average temperature more. And a study, a recent study of, of uh, heat waves in uh, New York City, in the Bronx, showed that there was higher mortality in areas where you just had a few big parks and then lots of housing compared with areas with lots of small parks. So this is a really serious matter uh, in terms of planning um, as we move forward. Um, oh God. You've got to be very sensitive to your own this machine. So here's London um, uh, in May in the evening, about 10 o'clock at night, and here's the wind blowing from, from east to west. So one of the first things that every, every book on the uh, urban environments keeps talking about this world word, urban heat island. And that was an idea, first of all, talked about in London and Paris in 1810, 1820. But actually, the heat from these buildings as the wind blows, is it, well, all that heat is advected or carried downwind. So although there are some very hot spots in the middle, by and large, the heat is being, is being carried over the city. So the, t the heat, is at the temperature on average is sort of rising as you cross, cross the city. Um, and you can now see this in data, and this is a numerical modeling by using the, Met, the British Met Office model. Um, but of course, by day, you would be finding very comparable temperatures here and, and in the, in the um, in this, in the city. Oh God! Now here we are, back in Hong Kong, and the, one of the important points uh, that Prof, uh, Professor Lee and his team have shown is there's very big differences depending upon the nature of the building thermal flow physics. So if you have a building like this, which is a steel uh, and aluminium uh, building like this, at 
two in the, in the afternoon, it gets very hot already, so that's much hotter than a concrete sort of building here, which is heating more slowly. But conversely, at night, this has cooled down, this remains warm. So it's the warmth of these kind of traditional buildings that's what keeps the urban heat island, or the urban uh, heat, going at night. So depending upon how we build our cities, they will have quite a big effect. Um, and this is another, this is in fact London for the Olympic Games. To study the Olympic Games, people were concerned about what would be the temperature uh, in London. It's supposing there was a heat wave. Well, there wasn't, in fact. Uh, and so you'll see rivers and sports stadia, buildings. And it, over the 24-hour periods, as I shall show you, that you see quite different um, patterns. Oh, God. Now, um, so here is, the, here is uh, what happens is from 4 o'clock to 12 o'clock at night to, to 2300. You'll see that some parts of the city uh, are still really quite uh, warm, others are much cooler. Whereas at midday, of course, they will all have pretty well the same uh, temperature. So it means then that if you're, th if you're thinking about planning of hospitals and, and, uh, and housing of different areas, you can now do this on a planned basis. This is a modeling process which is now done daily in London and it's actually on an app uh, for people to study. In Hong Kong, uh, the measurements using the satellites uh, really are studying this, this, this variation of temperature. And again, you can see in the built up areas uh, over several months, this is quite warm, but there's lots of green areas in between. And Professor Nung may be talking about that later on. And so understanding this variation can really make a big difference to understanding welfare in a city. Um, there's obviously some problem with me and this machine. Um, another feature of cities is that uh, when we have very large cities, so that the length scale of the cities is much bigger than the sort of boundary layer depth, this one kilometer, then um, instead of the concentration being roughly constant as it is in a small city, uh, because the, 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 layer, the boundary layer grows or the, the mixed layer grows with distance, in a large city, this is all mixed here, and then we have this very serious problem that the, um, the, there's a sort of constant mass, the concentration times the time, uh, times the wind speed, times the height is proportional to the strength, times the length of the city. Uh, and so since vehicle emissions get larger in mega cities, and the traffic engineers at Tsinghua, for example, have told me about this, you find that the concentrations are, are, are becoming much larger in these large cities. In addition, of course, you've got indoor pollutant emissions. And one of the points at the moment is that there are methods being provided to, to provide concentrations in cities associated with external sources. But the internal sources also build up in this, in, in the, as you see, in, in, for example, in India. Then they get carried downstream. And we should be considering both of those. Currently, there are no cities I know where there are warnings for the interaction of outdoor pollution and indoor pollution. And actually, thinking about this lecture suggested that's what we should be doing. Um, um, of course, city, uh, pollution is complex in cities, and if you actually want to know about the pollution uh, around buildings, and you will find, interestingly enough, because of city, city streets with the traffic large in one area and not in the other area, you will see quite large differences. Uh, so this is London, uh, it's an aerial view uh, from the um, post office, uh, the GPO Tower all over uh, central London. And uh, this is an experiment with this using a special light. And you can see how pollutants move down a street, then run across street, and then down here, because the wind is traveling across here. This now enables you to make models and, and as I say, a, a warning to, to individuals who may be having breathing difficulties living in their houses, uh, but using this greatly improved ability to model. Um, and the other feature, of course, about cities with traffic is that you have very high concentrations in particular areas where, you, where the traffic. And one of the, uh, the worst stories recently in, in Beijing was the fact that a, a young girl aged eight years old living near a crossroads um, died of lung cancer because of this, which is very unusual for somebody at, at, such, a, at such an early age. Um, and so the understanding the, the, the variation is critical to the... Um, uh, the, the, the interesting developments in Shenzhen and, and Guangzhou in this area ha have shown that uh, 
to start with, the, the loss of visibility was rising and the PM10 was rising, and then it was more or less uh, um, constant. Um, so in a way, this is an interesting st statistic because the pollutants would be rising um, uh, if they had the same, same, same intensity of emissions, but by the, s the city is larger. But because, in fact, there, there's industrial emissions have been decreased, you're actually in a more or less a static situation there. Um, one of the features about urban areas over the history of them in terms of pollution, and therefore which both is external and internal, is, is that if you do a little history, in the 1950s, for example, in London, we had smog. That led to national regulation. Then, another th then we had oil, so-called oil-fired power stations. But then we had the problem of acid rain, which, of course, uh, was uh, affecting Scotland and affecting, uh, and affecting um, Scandinavia from the UK, but from Germany. Now, this was caused great trouble to the husband of our queen, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, who told me that it was ruining his fishing, all this acid rain, uh, and what was I going to do about it, or what was the electricity going to do? Well, fortunately, they did do something about it. They cleaned up the acid. Uh, and then, of course, you had the next problem. We had climate change, uh, which, of course, has greatly changed the way we do our energy uh, and is having a long-term effect on plants uh, and uh, and, uh, and other features of the UK, but in the other countries of the world, as we've seen, very serious matters. So what's the solution? Of course, one of the solutions is, in fact, to have smaller cities, to have international regulations. So all the time we have a source of pollution, then we have a regulation, then we have another problem, and all the time we're having to sort of keep together the societal responses uh, with the technological developments. Um, one of the, uh, this is a, if you go on the web and you look at something called cucumber, you'll see this is an interesting Italian uh, uh, um, sort of engine, really, or, or uh, uh, network system on, on the internet using the Google map in which people can, people as well as governments could put all the sources of pollution um, on the city and in many areas of the world. And this is true in China as well as Italy and, and England. There's lots of informal areas of, of pollutants uh, which have cumul cumulatively had a big effect. So by allowing, uh, enabling having a system that people can put what they see as happening and other people can check on it, you're actually now finding more accurate uh, uh, and controllable pollution, which is leading to government to operate in quite a different way. Um, um, well, if we compare temperature and pollution in urban areas, uh, basically the, the message is that as the, as the cities grow, we're having more of this excess temperature at night, we're also having more of this excess pollution. And the policy for urban areas is low total carbon, you, you have new buildings, less non-fossil energy, uh, less fossil energy, more non-fossil energy. You need to have more recycling, and of course you need to have public transport. And one of the other solutions, of course, is to have smaller cities. In other words, if, if, L, if cities are going to produce worse pollution as the LU increases, we need to have smaller. And we need to have garden cities, not, I think, suburban cities. In fact, some of the cities in the United States, which are very large but not very dense, they have actually some of the highest uh, emissions per person because everybody drives 20 miles to buy a loaf of bread, which is not... Um, an example of a garden city, of course, is, um, as I mentioned to you, Port Harcourt in Nigeria. So having these ecological cities, and China has a, some examples of those, and that's very interesting. Oh, drives me mad, this machine. Well, it obviously requires a different sort of... Now, if we just move from outdoors to indoors, um, the design and topology of outdoor, indoor spaces and urban areas is changing partly because it's much easier to build, build uh, much more sophisticated kinds of shape, shapes and sizes. Um, also, we now can have uh, consider the control system. We can consider taking to the, consider natural ventilation, engineering ventilation. Uh, we can consider, of course, how the weather is changing. So all of those uh, um, enable the outdoor-indoor relationships to be, to be changed. And as I said, also, there is a question of community control uh, which is which is important. Now there, of course, uh, uh, the, the again, uh, Professor Sundell mentioned the importance of fluid mechanics or CFD. Well, one of the uh, difficulties, of course, is that is that the processes of, of airflow within buildings is very chaotic. Uh, uh, recently, we uh, w w 
my wife and I were building a small house in France and, and we studied in some sense the rather interesting chaotic airflows you have with heating and all the sort of different sources. Uh, so it is very complex and it's not just a, not, not just a question of a bigger computer. Um, now, uh, this is my, my the two, two points I just wanted to make. You have the, zo the zone between outdoors and indoors, and these zones have many kinds of uh, um, airflow being forced into them uh, and also protection. Um, and one of the nice things you see when I visited Guangzhou, for example, is the effect of trees, down, trees down, the, down a street. It has an enormous impact on, co on cooling the street. The radiation is changed, uh, and so that's something we need to, need to think about. Now, one of the, the interesting sort of pieces of physics is that, we can s is that there's a, one of the puzzles to people in, in uh, planning hospitals or, or rooms is what is the nature of the flow? Um, is there, a, if we have turbulent flows generated, is it just remain turbulence? Or uh, do we in fact have mean flow patterns? Well, the answer is in any square container with randomness, it always leads to significant mean flow. Often this is not um, predictable. If I have a box and I shake it on the top with water, you'll tend to find the flow will go one way in the morning and another way in the afternoon because there's a very, very, a very, very uh, um, um, subtle balance. And CFD is not very good at doing that, but what CFD can, t can tell you is that if I give it a force in one way and then a force in the other way, then it will tell you what will happen. But the probability of that uh, has to be often done by experiment. So therefore, this is an example of moving from small eddies to larger eddies, as well as the classical process of bigger eddies going to smaller eddies. And the question of upscale and downscale balance is now something that uh, we are beginning to have to think about much more in the turbulence modeling. Um. Now, uh, well, this is, this is a more complicated map of, of the way in which if you look at turbulence, you can see that there's, there are simple areas when essentially the flow processes are changing quite, quite, um, um, uh, when, 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 yeah, when, when they're, when they're in local, local adjustment, they're, as it were, smaller time scale, smaller length scale. But all the problems that we have of unsteadiness is when you actually, is that the eddy sizes are comparable with the size of the container, the turbulence it is of the same size, size as the changing conditions like the atmosphere and then you find that the the modeling either has to be using more complex hybrid, hybrid modeling or, um, or, or or experiment and uh, defining this these areas of uncertainty is actually for example in the aircraft industry something that they are finding new techniques to, to deal with um, the other feature of turbulence is that uh, the traditional picture, if you find the old movies about turbulence, say turbulence is something which mixes things. Well, the answer is not quite, because turbulence often creates these layers. Even in a simple boundary layer, you have a very sharp uh, boundary at the top uh, and a very often very sharp internal boundaries. And if there's any stratification, uh, which it often is in buildings, hotter and cooler, then you find these layers are very persistent. So the mixing is therefore very non-uniform. Anybody who's known in a, been in a room when you, very, very often you have a sudden gust one way, a sudden gust the other way, temperature changing. So this is a feature, in fact, uh, of, of most, most turbulent flows. There's another question. Um, 10 um, minutes, please. All right. I just, I, I, I'll go to this question here. Of, one of the questions uh, which has been an issue in Hong Kong, and you'll hear more about this, is that uh, you have these uh, complex buildings, too many buildings close together, as I showed you earlier, not enough wind. So if you put the, the building on stilts, you can get a better wind, a clearer wind. So underneath this uh, building, you can get high wind. Here you can have a stag stagnant zone. So that stimulated me to, with my colleagues, to study the effect well, I think you refer to as, as, as psychophysics. And so Dr. Poulton was in fact, he's actually a, a psychologist. And what we find of course in the high latitudes like the UK or New Zealand, people do not like turbulent winds, but in Hong Kong they jolly well like the turbulent winds. Uh, but understanding that process actually helps you then decide what are the important features of a building. Um, uh, so now, Finally, I just, well, on, on, in this area of physics, just mention the fact that the 
traditional idea of convection, it produces extra turbulence, so it would make, for example, swirling flow decrease. If you go home tonight and you do an experiment in your kitchen, you'll find it disagrees with most of the textbooks, namely that, in fact, if you stir some water and then you heat it, you find that the heating keeps the water going round and round and round, um, whereas all these classical methods say it would, it would decrease faster. So, so there are situations where we have to consider these, these processes more carefully. Um, uh, well, there's a diagram here to show you that. Uh, now, I just wanted to end with a, a couple of diagrams and a conclusion. One of the most important points, and Professor Tang will be here, is here at this conference, uh, is the question uh, of, structure, of, of eddy, eddy motions being produced uh, by not only by the edges of, build, edges of buildings and doorways, but also, of course, by people moving around in a space uh, and particularly breathing. And um, in fact, the interesting point is that because we actually, when we breathe outwards, we pr produce very coherent eddy motions, these can carry slightly smaller particles over longer distances. And in fact, I was, uh, there, was a, there was a rather nasty case, a murder trial. I was an expert w witness. Uh, uh, I was just, uh, but I made the mistake. I explained the results all in one morning. They said, thank you, Professor Hunt. Uh, we don't need to come back. We understand perfectly. Um, and so what you want to do in a trial is, of course, go on and on. Anyway, the result of this was that we explained how these droplets travel a long way, and I'm glad to say that the innocent man was let off. So I wrote an article with Professor Lee and Tang and Dr. Eames called Murder, Death, and Disease. Um, but uh, but uh, the, the, the question of how particles move, which of course is very important for disease, has got to be related to the eddy structures of the turbulence. Um, and finally, on, on this question, um, this is really a, a, a sort of results, literally, of, of this year, or finally published this year, that in fact, uh, t in a turbulent flow at very high Reynolds numbers, which we do have in big rooms, in fact, the very small eddies are all clustered. The most intense small eddies are clustered in layers, you can see on the right-hand side here, uh, and the sort of shearing motion ac across it. So to give you a kind of an image, um, uh, from a, a culinary image, you think of this as a spaghetti sandwich. You've got these shear layers and then you've got these awful vortices inside. But the interesting point, these vortices are very, very intense. They are of the order of the velocity of the large-scale motions. This, has been, this is really a, a quite a new result. The consequence of this, of course, is that small particles in this region can be thrown out much more intensively than in the past. So this is really a, 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 there's a, there's a big difference between this and the classical Kolmogorov idea of turbulence. And uh, finally, um, so my conclusions are that growing urban areas affect mean the peak environmental processes faster than climate change in many cases. We need uh, better measurements and warnings, especially adapted for these systems. The increased hazards and impacts caused by climate change, e.g. disease and uh, physical hazards, um, have got to be recognized. They also lead to be more emergency hospitals and shelters, which are inadequate or present in many cities uh, around the world. Indoor air processes interact with external environment via interface zones, which are quite complex in th terms of thermal effects and dispersion. Uh, and these are essential to the natural hybrid ventilation. And I believe that we need internal air quality advice and warnings needed uh, not least from governments drawing up legislation. So the policies have got to be to curb carbon use. We've got to have um, improved, reduced pollution from transportation. We've got to curb the growth of megacities. We need cooler, greener planning. And finally, people's input and control via technology, Google Map uh, and, and local measurements, uh, already are, are being seen to considerably add to the local control and improvement in the environment, and, and I believe this uh, could very, very much help with community action. Uh, it's a really interesting new area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hunt, for sharing um, this in interesting information for us, and particularly uh, calling to our attention the importance of fluid mechanics, which I. I think is underrepresented in the indoor environmental field and the 
um, special issues of the interface between the indoor and outdoor, uh, outdoor environment. Uh, particularly we see in Hong Kong, and you uh, uh, identified this issue to me several years ago, the notion of a, such a densely packed urban environment, start, the city starts to look like a naturally ventilated building um, or a naturally ventilated built environment, let's say, and, and the natural ventilation of the city itself sets a boundary on what we might ultimately be able to do in terms of living comfortably in a, in a mega city. So uh, we've reached the end of this uh, opening plenary session. Thank you for your attendance. I believe, uh, do we have an MC uh, announcement to close? Uh, the um, opening um, reception is going to start now. Uh, so if you would like to exit the hall from the back doors and there will be staff assisting you to the venue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.